CNS and CNRS, and we'll learn about university, universality and feature learning. As you can see, universality is the common theme for today's morning, but we'll move to tool your neural networks, and your slides are back. Great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> okay, thank you, Pragya. Um, let me start by thanking all the organizers. So it's a huge pleasure to be speaking at ICTP. Um, ICTP had a massive, a massive impact in Brazilian physics. So as a young undergraduate uh, in Brazil, I remember that most of my professors did either master's, PhD, or worse stuff here. So this place was like Mecca for us back in Brazil. So it's a huge pleasure to be here, especially giving a talk. So thank you the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So before starting, I'd like to acknowledge some of the collaborators that are gonna appear in works in this talk. There are many faces because uh, I'm gonna mention many works, um, but there are some in red, which are uh, the bulk of this talk is gonna be about the work that I did uh, with them. So Florent Jacala, Ludovic Stefan, who is here, uh, Luca Peche, and uh, Yatin Dandi, all of them uh, at EPFL. But yeah, as you can see, there are many uh, faces here that you can recognize uh, that are here in the workshop. Okay, let's uh, get to business. So the outline for this talk actually is gonna follow exactly the program uh, for this workshop. So um, it's very rare the cases where you give a talk where you can you know, align perfectly with the, with the title of the workshop. So I decided to use that as a guideline. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about learning from structured data. Um, so I'm gonna give a little introduction why structure is important in learning, and then we're gonna move to the other words of the title as we go on. So uh, I think we can roughly divide uh, you know, theoretical machine learning into two mathematical cultures. Um, maybe we are biased because most of people here work in one of these cultures, but it's always good to remember that there is a, another one, and I'm gonna start by this one because you know, I'm gonna move to the other, because I'm, I'm, I'm in the other, other side. So the two cultures are basically um, people who try to get guarantees, mathematical guarantees, on the properties of learning in very generic settings trying to make as little assumption as possible on the problem, and in particular on the data distribution. And I'm gonna call this like the worst case or agnostic case. Um, it's very powerful because once you have these guarantees, it's valid for any data. But let's say it's ambitious, right? Because you want to get something which is very broad. Um, the other culture is what we are more used in this workshop is like typical case where you make assumptions about the data. You have very sharp results, but of course these results are limited to the class of data that you assume to solve. Um, so, you know, there is a trade-off. There is no free lunch here. So let's try to just look a little bit about how worst case looks like and then we're gonna move to the other. And that's gonna be perfect because it's gonna allow me to introduce some of the notation I'm gonna be using uh, throughout this talk. So here we're gonna be talking about supervised learning. We have some data. Um, my data is always gonna live in RD and I'm always gonna assume that I have little n samples of data. So okay, that's important because also notation varies widely across this field. So, and I'm gonna assume this data is sampled from some probability distribution that, as you might imagine, later we're gonna specify. Um, so, in supervised learning, what is the goal? The goal is to try to find a function that links the inputs to the, to the labels. Uh, searching the space of functions is intractable, especially if you want to put in a computer. Um, so, what you do in practice is that we assume a subclass of functions. These are usually parametric functions. It doesn't need to be, but here, uh, and most examples that we're gonna see, they are. So for example, neural networks, um, linear models. And uh, then the problem of searching in the space of functions reduced to the problem of searching in the space of parameters, which is a bit more tractable. Then we need to, uh, we want something that generalizes. Um, the way we do this, typically in machine learning, since we don't have access to the data distribution, is to minimize some uh, loss function over the samples that we have in hand. So that's called empirical risk minimization. I'm sure you all know about that, and the goal is that once we do the training, um, we want to evaluate how good this training uh, on the training data generalizes in the sense of uh, how good the generalization error population risk is. So you know that the population risk is not over the data, but over the expectation over the loss function, so over new samples. So we want to, we, that, that's the goal of what we would like to minimize. Of course, we don't have access to the data distribution, so we cannot minimize that, 
So we use as a proxy like uh, to minimize the, the empirical risk, but we are hoping that by minimizing the empirical risk, we get good generalization. So that's the goal. And in particular, uh, we are interested in studying this problem when the number of data samples, P, which here is just like something that measures the size of my parameter space, so you can think about like total number of parameters of your parametric model, and the dimensions are large. And then I'm gonna be precise about large, what th this means later. Okay, so let's look at one example, uh, a classic example of a result um, in statistical learning theory. It's what is called like uh, the Hadamacher uniform bound. So here uh, is a bound that tells you something about the generalization gap. So you fix a hypothesis class, and then you want to know if you trained with a certain error, how good do you, ge do you generalize? So here you have, for all functions in this function class, let's think about like, I don't know, linear functions, or two layer neural networks, uh, how, 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 how good is my test error uh, compared to my uh, training error? And then this type of result bounds this by something called the Hadamacher complexity, which is a number which is associated to the function class that you chose. Different function classes, different uh, Hadamacher complexities. And the Hadamacher complexity essentially is the capacity of this function class to fit random labels. So here there's a connection with, uh, with the previous talk of Federica, because here, here really you're trying to bound the capacity of generalizing to the capacity of fitting uh, random labels. So, of course, this bound uh, might be good or bad, like, you know, it's a bound. It might be lousy or tight. And um, typically the Hadamacher complexity, and that's quite intuitive, depends on the uh, number of parameters in your function class, right? The more parameters you have, the more expressive you are, uh, the better you might be able to fit random labels, and so on. Uh, the big problem is that since the function classes that we consider nowadays are huge, um, the Hadamacher complexity might you know, scale with P, so it might be uh, very large and the bound might become lousy. And indeed, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about whether this is a good complexity measure to, to do this type of results, because experimentally you can just take a neural network, take a data set that you like, and try to see if you scramble the labels, if you can fit or not, and you can see that neural networks are capable of uh, pretty much always interpolating the data, even if the labels are random, which means that essentially their Hadamacher complexity is very large, which means that these bounds are very uh, loose. Uh, of course, this is not the only bound that there exists in statistical learning theory. There's a whole branch of statistical learning theory trying to incorporate uh, more information and getting tighter bounds, but this is like a classic result. And in particular, I want you to notice that this result doesn't use anything about the data distribution, right? So again, let, what I was going what to was, was saying is that maybe it's too ambitious to, to try to, general, to have a result which is generic in the data distribution. Um, here is a, just a small ex Yeah, John? So yeah, here, here is, is respect to, I think, a realization of the data that comes from a certain distribution. But the Hadamacher complexity depends on the data distribution indirectly because there is this expectation there over, um, wait, no, I think it's conditioned on X, but it depends only on the likelihood, like the expectations over Y given X, if I remember well. But we can, we can verify. I think it's conditioned on X, in the definition. It depends on the input-output rule, yeah. but not on the distribution of the x's? Yeah, so I think it's like you have a realization of x, you fix okay. the realization of x, and then you define the Hadamacher complexity condition on, on x, and you take an expectation over y. Okay. y being the random label. Um, so random according to the, this teacher rule? There's no teacher. So but the, the, but, but so if you talk about a rule, what do you... Here, here in the definition of the Hadamacher complexity, you take the original labels, you scramble them, you take them to be random IID from minus one, one, and then you take this expectation respect to Y, if I, if I remember well. But okay, so the Ys are IID? IID here, okay. binary okay. in the hypercube. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and then, because here you're exactly seeing the capacity of the model of fitting random labels condition on the inputs being okay. whatever data set that you, that you took. Okay, thanks. If I remember well, but we can double check that. I'm, as you might imagine, that's not my, my field, but <laughs> I'm just giving you a flavor because I think it's important when you talk about uh, theory of machine learning to, to have like the two sides. Um, okay, uh, here I'm giving you an example about 
just a very simple task where I, here I have a teacher. I'm drawing a teacher from a perceptron with some weights that I fixed and some Gaussian data. And I'm comparing like the performance that I get from just doing logistic regression on this data um, with the bound that you get from computing the Hadamaka complexity for this uh, hypothesis class, the linear hypothesis class. So in here, everything is very well understood. And you can see that you know for some data, Gaussian data, for example, the logistic performance is much closer to what would be the base optimal performance that takes into account the structure of the data than to the bound. So there is a huge gap there. And, but of course, this is one, just one example again. Like uh, different classes of data might shift this curve up closer to the bound or down closer to the base optimal performance. But just to, just, just to exemplify that, you know, there is a difference between uh, typical and worst case. And it's important to take this into account if you want to have theories which uh, are very, very sharp. And moreover, uh, we also know that in general, the problem of training a neural network can be NP-hard in the worst case. So here is an example where uh, you just want to train a two-layer neural network or a few hidden units, and you want to find the weights such that you can perfectly interpolate the data. And you can find a specific configuration of the data such that finding these weights is NP-hard. You can map to an NP-hard problem. So in general, also, the problem can be algorithmically intractable even if you could have some, some guarantees on the generalization. OK, so of course, there is a lot of work trying to extend everything that is statistical learning theory to take into account uh, the data structure. So I have in mind, like, you know, pack base. Um, and that's a very active uh, research line. But there is an alternative, which is the, what we, we are using and what we like, which is trying to actually model the structure of the data, and then trying to get very sharp guarantees. But again, the problem of that is that if you are too simplistic, then you might be having results which are too specific to something which is not relevant, right? And that's mostly what we hear from uh, referees in the RIPs, like, you know, oh yeah, Gaussian data, what, whatever, right? Um, but we like a lot Gaussian data, because with Gaussian data, we can basically do theory. We can basically compute things. And this is an example. Um, so this is a result from a paper. I mean, I, 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 I'm not expecting you to understand that. Uh, some of you will understand because uh, there's a lot of people who, who, are, who are into replicas here. But this is a result, uh, a theorem that we proved for a, a specific Gaussian covariate model um, that characterized perfectly the asymptotics of the error uh, in the high dimensional limit. And, uh, you know, uh, we can do this kind of things with Gaussian data. And we cannot do these things with, uh, let's say, more structured data. Can we? So. That's, that's maybe, maybe the question, like, the people working in this field is like trying to push the boundaries towards more and more structure. Of course, these equations are horrible, it's hard to parse, I don't want to go through them, but also coming from a physics culture, we like to plot things, and you have seen this a lot uh, in the previous talks. Um, so this formula you can put in the computer, and you can get this kind of curves, and you can predict interesting properties. So for example, what is the decay rate of the uh, generalization gap as a function of n? Does it decay as 1 over n, 1 over square root of n? Is it closer to the base optimum? Is it closer to the, to the Hadamacher bound? And so on. So this is the typical kind of result we can get with Gaussian data. And that's why we like Gaussian data. We can get the rates, but we can also get the full curve. Um, but of course, if you are referee number two, that's what you're going to say. Isn't this too simple? And this brings me to the first part of my talk. Uh, which is just going to be an overview because Federica already did a great job justifying why Gaussian data might be, uh, might be realistic. So universality, that's what comes to our, uh, our saving. And so in the past few years, uh, there has been a lot of progress in trying to justify this Gaussian assumption. And, you know, progress both in an experimental side, like a lot of uh, uh, work showing that certain data sets are very close to have the Gaussian performance, um, but also progress on the mathematical side. So there has been many universality theorems that have been proven that show that for certain model classes, um, Gaussian might be good enough. And these are like um, central limit theorem kind of results. So because uh, here I want to stress one thing is that we are not saying that data is Gaussian. What we are saying is that for a given task, for a given model that you want to fit on the data, Maybe this model depends on the statistics, which is low dimensional. For example, the projection of the data in a subspace. And things being Gaussian in low dimensions is much easier than being Gaussian in high dimensions, right? Because there are central limit theorems kind of results. 
And many of these results have been proven um, over the past. And a lot of them draw back uh, from seminal works coming from random matrix theory, uh, from the physics literature. So there is uh, also one, I think, the work that Federica mentioned by Manfred um, on uh, SVMs, universality on SVMs is one of the precursors of, uh, of uh, all this line of results, but also like a lot of results from signal processing. So results by Donohue and Turner and so on. Um, and as I was uh, hinting before, like the, the motivation here is like not to think that, right, the, the data is Gaussian, but maybe the statistics of what we want to know, let's say the error, uh, might be equivalent to the statistics of a Gaussian predictor. So these, these results are known as Gaussian universality. Um, from our side of the, of the, of the field, um, they have been noticed like uh, by this work of, uh, of uh, Sebastian, Marc, Florent, Lenka uh, about the hidden manifold model, um, more or less concurrent with some work of uh, Song Mei and Andrea Montanari. Um, but as I said, this, this draws from a lot of ideas uh, from the past uh, as well. And there has been a lot, a lot of work that has been done in this direction, let's say in the past five years. So here I'm just giving like, you know, name dropping, a lot of work. So, and, and in particular, many interesting things can be computed. So uh, for example, uh, one line of work is like deriving the kernel rates. And I like that a lot because you know, the features of a kernel are definitely not Gaussian. Even if the date is Gaussian, the features of a kernel are not Gaussian. However, if you assume the features are Gaussian, you compute things using replica and you get the rates, you get exactly the rates uh, that you can derive from classical statistical learning theory and other rates that they have missed. And nowadays, like, you know, they, they, they are being proven by, by mathematicians without the Gaussian assumption. So a lot of things can be said when you uh, use universality. And, uh, and uh, you know, there has a, a lot of progress in the, in the past years from a lot of people in this room and, uh, and other groups. So here I'm going to focus in one line of work, uh, which is related to the analysis of uh, the random features model because what I'm going to say next builds on that. So let's, let's take a look about uh, some of the results which are known in this case. So the model I'm going to be looking at is like a teacher-student model. So I'm going to assume um, I have a target function. This target function is generated by a two-layer neural network with uh, first layer weights W star and second layer weights A star. Um, and I'm going to be fitting, so I'm going to assume that the data, uh, the inputs itself, they are Gaussian. But note that the, 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 the distribution of the features are not Gaussian because I'm passing them through a nonlinearity times uh, a matrix. Um, and then given this data set, this synthetic data set, um, I want to learn it with also a two-layer neural network. Um, so I'm going to learn with a different two-layer neural network um, with weights W and A. And in particular, they don't need to have the same number of hidden units. So on the model side, I'm going to be assuming that the first layer weights are fixed. So this is what is known as a random features model. I'm just learning the second layer, not the first one. And this model has been introduced uh, in the context of kernel methods to try to approximate kernels um, at finite number of uh, features. So that's a toy model. You can try to justify it like saying, OK, you know, in the lazy regime, um, your network might behave like, you know, the weights are fixed at initialization and effectively is like doing that. Um, there's a lot of shortcomings to that, as we're going to see, but that's one way of thinking about it. But you can also think as a model that approximates kernel methods. And then we are going to be looking at the training of the second layer, A, which I call A here, that has P uh, parameters, because this is the number of uh, hidden units on the, on the two-layer neural network. So you're going to minimize the empirical risk with respect to some objective and some regularization. And the convenient thing about fixing the first layer is that this problem is effectively convex, right? If the, if the loss function is convex and you have a regularization which is convex, this might be either convex or strongly convex. So, you know, it's, uh, it's much easier than analyzing the joint training of both layers. Um, so that's good because under these assumptions, we can do theory. So we are happy. Uh, we can characterize the performance of this model. And uh, this is a work that uh, we have done uh, together with, uh, with Federica a couple of years ago and generalized some results of uh, Andrea Montanari and Song Mei that uh, looked at this problem for the square loss. So if you, again, 
I don't want you to parse these equations because they are horrible. If you like replicas, you understand them. If you like also like, you know, Gordon, me, Max, you also understand them, but they, they, they are not easy to parse if you, are, if you are not used. So it's better to look at some plots. And that's the kind of typical plot we get for the random features model. And this, this plot is very nice because it reproduces some behavior that we have observed in statistics, which is the so-called double descent phenomena. It's the idea that, you know, as you increase the number of parameters in your network, um, you, uh, you first degrade your performance because you're having more and more expressivity, so we have this bias variance trade off where you expect that if you, I don't know, fit something with a polynomial very high degree, uh, you're gonna fit the noise. But then, eventually, this peak goes down and the minimum of the generalization error appears when the number of parameters go to infinity. So this is something that has been experimentally observed with neural networks back in, I don't know, 2018 or maybe 17. And uh, people thought that this was something specific about neural networks, why neural networks have this uh, weird property. And then later, the community realized that linear models can, can have the same property. And here is one example of a linear model that has this property. Um, so, you know, put in question some, some of the, let's say, uh, dogmas of, uh, of uh, basic statistics. So we learned a lot of stuff studying this model. Uh, my, my goal here is not uh, to, to go into details on, on that. Um, but um, one thing that I want you to notice here is that even though we are happy because we can draw these curves, the, universality, the Gaussian universality of the features in this model, which is the basic tool that we need to solve this model, no matter what technique you use, um, makes it equivalent to a linear model with a given covariance matrix. And that's nice, because we can do theory, so Gauss is happy. However, uh, we have limited expressivity, because a linear model you know, is a linear model. So you cannot really uh, fit very complex class of functions. So it's, it's sad. Like, we, we have this tool that allows us to do theory, but on the other hand, this tool is also doomed because limit is the class of uh, problems that we can, uh, class of learning problems we can approach. And this is where it comes uh, the second part and the bulk of this talk, which is going beyond universality. So what can we say uh, when we don't have Gaussian universality? So Gaussian universality is great, we can do many things, but, you know, also limit us in doing theory. So now I'm gonna be talking about this last work, which is a very recent work. I think we put on archive like maybe one month ago. So that's the first time I presented, so I'm very happy to hear feedback uh, and discuss more. So of course we're not get, we're gonna get into the techniques, uh, but I'm happy to discuss in the blackboard later. So this work um, is essentially inspired by um, a work uh, of the group uh, of uh, Jimmy Ba in Toronto that observed that indeed, um, if you, uh, if you have a random features model, uh, you are limited by the best performance of a linear kernel, but if you update, now if you train the first layer weights for one step, maybe you can go get below that. So we are going beyond the features model by doing training, not fully training, but one step of training. And the performance of the model that you get um, depends on the size of the step that you do. So if you do a, st a step of size uh, order one, respect to the input dimension, then you go a little bit down, but you're always bounded by this linear predictor. To actually do better than linear, you need to take a big step, and uh, a step which actually scales with the, di with the dimension of the problem. And notice that what is uh, interesting about these curves is that you know the curves which are above the black line are curves for which we can do theory because Gaussian universality works. So we can actually characterize the solid lines passing through this point. Now, the ones down this curve, we cannot really say much. We can just you know, plot them and we see that they do better than a linear model, but you know, we cannot characterize. So we got into this question of trying to understand what can you learn after you do one step of gradient descent on the first layer weights. So, um, this brings us to the main, one of the main theoretical results of this paper. Um, so for that, we need some notation. So we're gonna define here a correlation matrix. So if you are from physics, these are just like, you know, um, the normalized overlap. So on the top, you have something like M, the teacher-student overlap, and on the bottom, you have just the normalization of the norm. Otherwise, you can think cosine similarity between the weights of the teacher and the weights of the student. And we're gonna say that we learned something 
if we have in the asymptotic limit if this thing is order one. And if we're going to say that we don't learn something if this thing like, vanishes, uh, the correlation between the teacher and student, the normalized correlation vanishes after this gradient step. So that's, that's whenever I say learning, not learning, is respect to this measure. And then later we're going to see something about generalization. But first you're just going to see like whether uh, after one step we can actually correlate our gradient with the weights of the target. So we're also going to need um, some, uh, technical, uh, some technical thing, which is everything is going to depend on uh, the Hermite coefficients of the target function. So, you know, if you are more from maths, this is very natural because, you know, the target, since the data is Gaussian and the Hermite is a, base, a complete basis over the Gaussian measure, you have this nonlinearity, the hardness of the problem is to deal with this nonlinearity, so it's quite natural to expand this nonlinearity in the basis of the Hermite polynomials. So, in particular, the difficulty of the problem is going to depend on the, non, no, the first non-zero uh, Hermite coefficient um, of the target function. So we are going to define the leap index, which is this L, to be the first non-zero Hermite coefficient. Okay? So that's going to be very important for what follows. So just remember, leap index measures the hardness of learning and is related to the first non-zero Hermite coefficient of the target. So the result goes like that. So that's the theorem we have in, uh, in the paper. So let L be the leap index of the problem and assume you know, that the, the activation function that we are using to fit is expressive enough to learn this function. So we also need to assume that we are able to, to learn. Like we have an activation function that is not like some, something linear, ne linear network for the, for the student. Otherwise, things wouldn't work. Um, so we s if the leap index is one, basically after one step, with linear number of samples, we can learn something on a subspace, which is an average over the, the teacher uh, coefficient. So we can learn a function which is beyond the random features, but functions that depend only on this direction, which is kind of an average direction of the target, and the average is weighted by the Hermite coefficients. So otherwise, if the leap index is larger than one, we are going to be able to learn a subspace, which is the span of this, of this, uh, of this teacher weights. However, we are going to need number of samples, which is proportional to the dimension to the, to the leap index. So, you know, and all you can learn is that. So that's essentially what the theorem is telling you. Depends on leap, the leap index, you can learn a subspace, but to learn the subspace, you need number of samples, which is uh, scales polynomially in the dimension uh, with the power given by the leap index. So again, this is a technical result, and maybe it's easier to be seen as a figure. So here, uh, we can think about you know, our target, and we can think how, much, how many samples we need to learn the directions of the teacher, and we have a single index regime that we can just learn a perceptron, this perceptron given by the average over the, over the teacher, if we have just linear number of samples. And actually, to be able to learn more directions, like to learn a, a larger subspace, uh, we need to have samples which scale as d to the power of the leap index. And, um, and we can only learn that at this sample regime. So that's, that's one result. It generalizes all the results, um, again, by the, the paper of, uh, of uh, the group of Jimmy Bai in Toronto, but also um, some uh, paper by the group of uh, Jason Lee in Princeton that, that showed uh, the, some parts of this result for the case d squared, so the leap index equals to, to 2. So here we generalize for any leap index. And we can see this in a concrete example. So here we take a target function which is given by, you know, fakely we, we choose an activation function which is given by the Hermites, and we're trying to learn two hidden units. And you can see here in red, the red curve is the random features model. And then you see the random features model is limited by, uh, by uh, the linear predictor. So if we take now something that you know, you can learn this first direction, you can go down in error. And to be able to go more down in error, you need, uh, you need more samples. So this is essentially like exemplifying the other, uh, the other curve, but in a practical example. And another way of seeing that, uh, that we like a lot, is to plot this into these uh, cosine similarity plots. So here, the big circle is of radius one. So the cosine similarity one, meaning that we learn, uh, 
if, if the points, the points, each point is one hidden unit. So if the points are in the boundaries of the circle, it's good because we are learning something, we are correlating uh, with correlation order one. And there is a small circle in the middle, which is the circle which is of radius one over square root of d. So remember we're taking d to be large here. So if you stay in this ball, meaning essentially that as d is larger, uh, you're gonna stay at uh, initialization. You're not gonna be able to correlate uh, when d gets larger. So here you can see like, uh, taking the target functions to be, you know, first Hermite, then the leap index is one. Then you have second Hermite, leap index two, third leap index three and fourth. And the number of samples you need actually to exit this small circle of radius one over square root of d uh, is gonna depend on the leap index of the problem. So if you have the leap index which is one, uh, you can get out of that and learn this direction as soon as you have n of order d, yeah? So most natural activations that you can think of, they are gonna have leap index one, they're gonna have a first non-zero Hermite. So I, I think, for example, ReLU, that's the case, hyperbolic tangent, like most of the activations you can think of. Uh, phase retrieval, no. Phase retrieval is gonna have a leap index two. And that, that's why we like it, right? Like Marco was, uh, was talking about phase retrieval. We like it because it's a prototypical example of a hard function to learn. Um, so yeah. I, 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 would think, I would think like, you know, polynomials of degree L are leap index L, and uh, normal activations leap index one. But they might also have gaps, and this is gonna be important uh, later. But for now, we're just talking about the first non-zero Hermite. So most of activations you're thinking of, they have leap index one, meaning that with N proportional to D, you're gonna learn a subspace, which is, uh, which is uh, proportional to the average over the the neurons of the teacher weighted by the, the Hermite coefficients. So, yeah. So here we are taking like some artificial example just to be able to like, you know, show uh, that the theorem, uh, is illustrate the theorem. Okay, so that's, uh, that's for uh, everything you can do with one step. So if there is not other questions, I'll move to multiple steps, but yeah, this is uh, gonna build uh, a lot on the previous theorem. So if you have any question, uh, interrupt me. Yeah, Marco? Yeah? X is Gaussian, yeah. Oh. And uh, R is a constant. R is, yeah. And you shoot for something like weak recovery, so you, you don't want to recover exactly, so you're happy with any correlation. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I don't want to recover exactly. I just want to correlate okay. with, uh, with the teacher with an order one correlation that doesn't decay with square, like with D. Okay, thanks. Yeah. No, that, that's a good point. R being small is a good point because uh, we know that two layer neural networks can basically approximate everything if they have, you know, smooth activations, for example. So there is no free lunch, right? If you have a very complex function, a function that, you know, it's very, very uh, discontinuous, like non-smooth, et cetera, then you need a lot of hidden units to to express this function. So if your teacher is given by that, like with R, which is very, very, very large, um, you cannot expect like to learn this perfectly uh, in a simple way with one gradient step and, and so on. So here, here uh, we are considering functions that depend on a subspace of dimension R, and R is fixed. But of, of course, you know, here, here, here we take a two-dimensional example, you take 10, 12, and, and, and play the same game. Um, okay. So can we say something about several uh, giant steps? Remember here that these steps, they are not order one steps, right? They are like large steps. So you can think them also as several steps of order one learning rate or one step of a large learning rate. And here we're gonna take several steps of large learning rate. So here things are gonna depend a lot on the structure of the target that you're trying to learn. Essentially, if your target function um, depends on something which is just like, you know, an average or a sum over uh, the same activation function, the story is gonna be pretty much, uh, it's gonna be pretty much the same. So if, if you have like uh, this type of activation, essentially for several steps, 
we are going to be, not much is going to change. If you take several steps, you still need the number of samples proportional to the leap index to be able to learn the different directions. Um, if, if your target has a certain structure. And that's important because um, with several steps, we are able to learn more than with one step, but for a particular class of target functions. And now I'm gonna discuss this class of target functions. So um, here I'm giving one example that is not in this class of target functions, but for which things don't change as you take several steps. And uh, actually in the, in the paper we proved that if you take a teacher, which is just an average over one, the same activation, whatever you want, uh, basically the theorem, uh, the first theorem that I described to you is, is all that is for, for many steps of order, I mean 10 steps, 15 steps, so on. Um, now, however, if you have a target function which is heterogeneous, so that, you know, depends on some linear combination of your activation functions, but in a heterogeneous way, so not, not a, a k not all equals to one, then depending on this combination, you might be able to learn more um, with a few steps, even if you have order uh, D samples. So, yeah, here I stress that that's, that's, that's important. And uh, essentially, what we can say is that even with a few, even with a few steps, uh, if your leap index is larger than one, you might be able to learn different hidden units of your target by taking a few steps, depending on what this A is. And uh, a new direction might be learned as you take more and more steps. Yeah? Yeah, so, so here, here essentially what we are thinking of is like the first layer is just D, right? It's just like the input data. And then um, the, first, the, first, first plot, the first, first neural network is just a perceptron then. Because just taking your input, taking a linear combination and passing through a nonlinearity. You see the second one instead is something more a, two -layer neuro, a true two-layer neural networks where we have R equals to four there in the second one. And then... Uh, R equals to five, R equals to six, I think. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. So the idea is here, how much, how many samples do you need to learn each of these directions with your student? And the first theorem tells you that um, if you just have N equals order D samples, you can only learn one direction. So effectively you're doing, learning a linear model. Then if you have D squared, you might be, learn, be able to learn the other directions. And this is going to depend on the leap index. Now, now we have a second axis, which is the first axis is just like for one step, one big step. Then we have the second axis, which is taking several steps. And essentially what I'm telling you is that depending on the structure of the target, and I'm going to be precise in the next slide of what type of targets can be learned in this way, um, you might be able to learn more than one direction, even with linear samples in the dimension. Um, by taking several steps. So we can go beyond theorem one. We can learn more directions, not only a linear, because theorem one tells you with any proportional to D, you can only learn one direction. It's the direction which is the average of all directions. Now, if you take several steps, you might be, learned, might be able to learn more directions, but not for all classes of target. And I'm gonna be precise now which, which, which class of target you can. Raja? So heterogeneity, by that you imply like just learning the more directions or it's a function of the target class which you're gonna get to? Heterogeneity, I mean just that uh, the target function that you're trying to learn is a linear combination of the hidden units. And this linear combination is not uh, just, uh, you know, one over the width for one. Like the, all of these A, A star Ks, they need to be different for you to be able to, to learn with N equals to D and more steps. So, and I'm gonna be precise, like what, what kind of functions uh, you are able to learn with more steps in this regime. But there is also potential sigma star k contributed heterogeneity that could come in to the role, right? Ah, like yes, k, those yeah. Could be different also. yeah, that would yeah. Be another but what we can prove is that if you just have sigma k, um, if you just have a sigma, you don't have an ak, you have ak equals to one for all k, then this function is not in this function class that you can learn with several steps, just having n equals to d. You can also show that. 
So this specific, I mean, it's very specific, right? I mean, we're talking about targets, and this is a very specific target, it's a target which is basically average over different hidden, the hidden units, the, the activations can be different, but it's an average over these activation functions. So, okay, so this idea uh, was actually first introduced uh, by a paper in the group of uh, Emmanuel Abe, which is they call staircase functions. So staircase functions are these functions for which you can, after several steps, learn um, even in the n equals to d regime. Um, so what, 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 are, what, what are these function classes? These are functions for which after you learn a linear direction in the target, condition on that, you are connected to a different direction. So in which sense? Let's, let's take an example. Let's take y is just a linear combination of uh, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 1 square minus lambda 2 square. So after one step by theorem 1, if you are here, we are always in the n equals to d regime. So in the proportional regime in the number of samples. After one step, what you can learn, you can learn one direction, as theorem 1 tells you. And this direction is basically the sum of, of the two hidden units of the, of the teacher, uh, w1 star and w2 uh, star. After you learn this direction, condition on this direction, since this function can be expressed uh, as, uh, as uh, something that connects z2, uh, actually here I, I realized that I haven't, maybe I should, uh, yeah, maybe I should show this. So we can rewrite this, this function as something plus something times something. And then we can, in this change of basis, you have lambda one prime. Lambda one prime is lambda one plus lambda two. And you have a second uh, direction, which is lambda one minus lambda two. And you can see that the, the, first di the second direction is connected to the first because they are multiplied together. So this means that condition on lambda one, the target is linear on lambda two prime. So this is a staircase function. It's a function that condition on the first direction that you learn, which is the linear combination of the, of, the, of the directions of the target, you are connected to the other direction that is left. So here is an example in which in two steps, you can learn these two directions. Now, what the class of functions that you cannot learn, and then you have uh, the second example, it's targets which, for example, now we have a plus there instead of a minus. So if now you write this in terms of the first direction plus whatever is orthogonal to the first direction, you see that the second direction now is not coupled to the first direction. And in this case, in the first step, you learn the first direction, but in the second step, in the n equals to d regime, you don't learn the second direction. Now you need to go to d squared to be able to learn this direction. By taking order one steps, you never get there because the gradient is not correlated with the second direction when you condition in the first direction that you learn. So this is an example where you cannot learn with multiple steps in this n equals to d regime. And then you can generalize this to every regime. There is a description of the class of functions which you can learn after you take several steps. And this is going to be these staircase, uh, staircase functions. Yeah? Here you are always thinking in the online learning regime where number of steps equal number of data, or would things change if you have a, if you see multiple times the data, or? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. So here we are assuming that every step we have a fresh sample of data. So yes, we are online, we have a batch, but this batch is fresh. It's not correct to the previous one. So proving this type of results for when the batch is, 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 is the same batch is much harder, so we don't have anything to say about that. However, if you just simulate, you see that uh, the same holds. Now, yeah, it's kind of an open problem to, to show the same kind of results when you have, like, for example, like just one batch of data that you reuse at every step. But so in this case, let's say you have a d squared data. Mm -hmm. So what, do, what does it mean? You would... Uh, if, you do, if you do two steps, you have two d squared data. You have seen two d squared data. Okay, no, but I mean, if you see multi, let's say you fix the number of data. Yeah. Then how, so let's say to d squared, then you would see multiple times the same data, would still the, like the, the, the phenomenology would still be the same? So as far as, far, as, far as we simulated, yes. Okay. Uh, but 
we didn't prove that. Okay, okay. We, we, maybe, maybe we depend on, for example, let's say you do mini batches. Maybe we depend on the resampling and so on. But, but I guess the first step would be just to use the same batch over and over again, the same one. But that's a good point. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of crucial for the theorems. Um, so, okay, if you are interested uh, in the theorem, uh, there is a way of formalizing what I just explained to you. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I had another question. Um, can you go back just to the previous? Yeah. yeah. Can you explain the linearity condition? Is that an, does it have to be linear? Or, um, like, why, is, why do you require that it's linear in Z2 prime? And not just, like, independent, depends on Z2 prime, or? Well, I mean, in the second case, for example, it's not linear in, in, in lambda 2 prime. Oh, right, okay. And so this is exactly the case where you are not, so when, the, the result is that whenever you are connect, linearly connected to the previous learned direction, then you have this staircase structure. If you don't, then you need more data to be able to see this direction. That's essentially what we are saying. Okay, so it's a form of kind of um, suppression, uh, like higher order suppression. Somehow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. and that's actually how the argument goes uh, for, for the proof. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, I was gonna say that, okay, now I have to rebuild all the slide. Okay, I, what I was gonna say is that, okay, we have um, essentially, uh, in the general form that I explained to you before, uh, we have like a mathematical statement for what that means. We haven't fully proved it, so we, a, as it stands, is a conjecture. So I'm, I would be very happy to discuss that uh, with you if you are interested in trying to prove that. But we can prove a special case of what I just said, which is uh, up to two steps. But again, we observe that this holds to multiple steps. It's just more challenging to prove uh, this result at multiple steps. So we can see how the gradient correlates after two steps with the target. Multiple steps is just like a technically more demanding. You need to write more terms in the, in the equation. So in the general form, it's a conjecture. So let me give you an example of that. Again, like with these uh, plots showing like random features, random features of limited learning and class of function. Uh, here is a function that always in n equals to d. Um, in the left side, one that you cannot learn in multiple steps, so it's not staircase. And in the right hand side, a function which is a staircase. So in two steps, you can see like in these correlation plots that, that we like, we have the, again, the circle is a circle of radius one. So if a point is there, it means that you have correlation one uh, with this direction. And here you have a function that has two directions. These two directions are coupled via staircase structure. And what you can see is that after two steps, you're able to perfectly go to these directions. While there is a case where this is not the case, you get stuck in the first direction that you learn because to see the other direction, you need more samples. So that's, that's, a, that's an illustration. Okay, I see I have little time, so let me just flash through uh, what we can say about generalization. Because so far, we only talk about correlation. So we only talk about how doing one step in terms of feature, like updating your first layer steps, you correlate or not with the target. But I didn't say anything about whether you generalize or not if you correlate, right? So, so far, everything that I have said is about this correlation matrix and whether you can have learning or no learning in the high dimension regime. What about generalization? Okay, so now we are gonna look at minimizing. So everything so far, we have ignored the second layer because you're just looking at the correlation of the first layer. So now we are gonna minimize the second layer. So let's say you did the first, you did the first step or two steps or three steps and you have updated your, sec your, uh, your first layer weights and now you learn the second layer on the top of these fixture fixed features. So you do the first few steps, and then now you learn on the top of that, like disjointly. So no, it's not, I'm not learning both things together. Can I say something about the quality of the learning that I have? So the answer is that we have uh, some bounds on the generalization performance, and the bounds look just like the bounds that I showed you before about the, what random features can learn or not. So I told you that random features um, uh, have a limited expressivity um, depending on the regime of the number of samples you have. So here you can say the same thing, um, but essentially what you're saying is that the generalization error that you're gonna get if you do empirical risk minimization is gonna be bounded by whatever you didn't learn. That's essentially the moral of, uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this conjecture that in general is also a conjecture, but we proved 
again, uh, a special case of this conjecture. But essentially, what you have to have in mind is that morally, assume that you have learned a subspace, then we expect that on the direction that we have learned, uh, we are able to have good generalization. So we are able to down our error by, uh, with, in these directions. However, in the orthogonal directions, the ones that we did not learn, uh, we can do as well as a random features model would do. So it's quite intuitive, like uh, I would say, uh, what this implies to generalization. So essentially, we're saying that if you learn the second layer, um, you are, are only going to get generalization as good as the ones in the directions that you have learned, and all the all the rest is going to just act as noise. So, okay. So that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, what we can say about generalization. Of course, what we would like to say about generalization is to have learning curves, just like the ones that I showed you for for random features. So we don't have learning curves so far. Um, of course, that's what we would like to, and um, and we want to have an equality and not a bound um, in this in this uh, in this conjecture. So we are working towards that. It's it's challenging, but uh, we believe it's, it's doable. So this would be able to give us access to learning beyond this linear regime uh, and including feature learning into this statistical physics uh, point of view of, uh, of, of, of learning. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to tell you uh, today. Uh, let me summarize briefly uh, because I'm uh, just on time, I think. Um, so Gaussian universality is powerful, but is limiting. So for example, you cannot take into account the effects of feature learning. In one giant step, uh, we might be able to learn a subspace, and this subspace, the size of this subspace depends on the quantity of data we have in hand. Um, if you take several uh, uh, giant steps, you might be able to do better, but only for staircase target functions. And finally, I have uh, many open problems that I'm happy to discuss about closing the gaps into the, what we can prove, uh, and also about exact asymptotics, which is really what we would like to have. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Um, very nice talk, thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, could you comment a little bit on the connection at the level of the proof strategy between what you do with Sturkus functions and the approach by Abe et al? So I know the first paper, for example, is uh, for functions on the Boolean hypercube, but they yep. do have some stuff for Gaussian inputs. So I yep. was wondering if you so, have any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's 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 a good point. Uh, so essentially, from 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 our perspective, so from statistical physics perspective, the proof that the, the way they look at that is basically by um, reducing the mean field limit to a low dimensional set of structures, which is essentially like what we would call like the sudden, sudden solar framework for online learning. So the fact that you have functions on the hypercube, the dimension is large, the hidden layer size is large, means that you have an effective dynamics on few order parameters which are the overlaps. And then you can prove stuff from there. Here exactly we have the same, the same strategy, it's just that instead of looking at several steps uh, of online learning, seeing only one sample. We are looking on how the overlaps, so you write equations for these overlaps, and we see how these overlaps change after one step, but with a, f with a finite batch. So essentially, if you want, the, the sketch of the proof is that you start with GD, you write equations for the overlaps, um, and then you see, you prove some concentration results for that uh, after one step, and then you see whether this changes or not as a function of the dimension. So is this due to the fact that the uh, learning rate is much bigger in your case? Yeah, that, that's crucial, because this learning rate is actually the critical learning rate. I forgot to mention that, so thanks, thanks, thanks for remembering me. Uh, so this learning rate, if you go above it or below it, either you blow up, like meaning that your dynamics is going to diverge after one step, it's going to blow up with the dimension, and if you go below this learning rate, you trivially don't learn anything. And that's essentially what the, the, the paper of uh, Bayetol also uh, ha have shown. So this learning rate is also what Greg Young calls like, I think, mu p parametrization. It's like, it's a critical learning rate such that you learn features and above it, your dynamics blows up. 
Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I had a quick one. Um, I'm trying to sort of build some intuition for like, for the leap index stuff, is there a really intuitive way to see why that would show up and is it connected to other measures of complexity of functions? No, that, 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 that's actually, I think, is a very deep question because the, the problem here is that we have this nonlinearity, right? And there are two ways, like the, the only way you, you, you get away with this nonlinearity is to linearize things because you cannot do theory for this nonlinearity. You don't know what is the distribution of what, whatever gets inside of this, this linearity in general. So the, the problem is that one way of linearizing this thing is to expand this nonlinearity in some basis that spans the space over the measure of the inputs. Now here the data is Gaussian. So Hermite is very natural. But you can think in general that if your data is not Gaussian, your data is from a distribution rho. If you have a complete basis of orthogonal polynomials in the base of rho, you might be able to have a similar theory. And actually, the, the staircase paper of, uh, of uh, Abe et al., they do exactly that for the hypercube, because in the hypercube, you have Fourier. And they do sphere, because you have spherical harmonics. Gaussian, because you have Hermite. Now, in general, I think, at least, it's a question that bothers me. It's like, um, of course, finding ortog orthogonal polynomials, like for a generic distribution, is very hard. But I ask myself, if we had these, uh, like, Expan harmonic expansion, would these results be just uh, generalizing to that? Even Gaussian equivalence, like, would you have like some equivalence for this class of measure respect to that? I, I, be, I, I tend to believe personally yes, but uh, the problem is that uh, I don't know many bases uh, for many distributions. Uh, so let's defer other questions to later when you can catch Bruno, and thanks so much for the really fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you.